Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons and researchers. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. I'll also be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert neurosurgeons, Dr. Kojo Hamilton. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Freelander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Freelander, thank you and please take it away. Well, thank you, uh, Justin. It's really a pleasure with, to be with all of you here today uh, again. As I usually do, I'd like to do two things. One is provide an update on the COVID pandemic and as it impacts uh, our hospital and our services, as well as to introduce Dr. Hamilton. So as you all are keenly aware, the uh, number of uh, COVID uh, positive patients have been increasing uh, fairly significantly and rapidly not only in our Allegheny uh, uh, region, but uh, really throughout uh, the country, uh, affecting different places at different uh, rates, but certainly uh, is uh, very different than what we saw with the first couple of, uh, of uh, waves. Now, it's the purpose of me making these comments is because I wanna make sure that anybody that needs help knows that we're here for them. Um, a good number of patients have been uh, uh, you know, unnecessarily harmed because of not uh, seeking care in a timely fashion because of their uh, concerns uh, with uh, COVID. Our hospitals are extremely safe. Uh, the uh, protocols that have been instituted both from uh, the cleaning uh, protocols to screening everybody that comes in, everybody's wearing a mask, everybody's temperature um, gets uh, checked and our hospitals are extremely safe and I feel very, very safe uh, coming here and going back home uh, is an example. So. Uh, again, I urge anybody that needs care not to delay uh, the care. In addition, we've uh, aggressively instituted uh, the use of uh, telemedicine, which again allows for us to evaluate our patients uh, uh, with uh, them not having to come here. It's uh, uh, obviously safer for them not, not to come here uh, at all, but also very, very um, uh, easy. You don't have to get in a car, you don't have to park and, and all that. So all of our neurosurgeons are are doing uh, virtual visits and obviously as necessary uh, in-person uh, uh, visits. So again, I urge anybody that needs care not to hesitate to reach out uh, to us. That's uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, now to our main uh, uh, feature uh, today, I'm, I'm really uh, delighted uh, to introduce uh, my colleague and uh, good friend, Dr. Kojo Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton has been with us for a number of uh, years now. He initially trained at the University uh, of uh, Virginia and spent uh, uh, some time in the important one, uh, Oregon, uh, where he started his uh, uh, professional career. And then we were really, truly fortunate to recruit him uh, here a number of uh, years uh, ago. Uh, I could say many, many positive things about uh, Dr. Hamilton, but he has to give his talk. But the one that, that really stands out to me is what a trusted partner he is, both to his colleagues, the other faculty neurosurgeons, but really he's a role model for the residents. The residents really love him. They're crazy about him and they, they seek him out. Uh, uh, he's won the uh, the uh, Teacher of the Year uh, Award, which again is something that our residents uh, uh, vote uh, anonymously uh, for. And uh, he's a great person, great family person, uh, amazing uh, physician and very, very talented. And uh, I look forward to his presentation. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, uh, please take it away. Thank you so much for your kind words, Dr. Freelander. And uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody tuning in. Um, and this is something that we all look forward to, and it's an honor to be given an opportunity to present. Uh, today's uh, topic is really about patient satisfaction um, and the use of patient satisfaction as a determinant of, of the quality and effectiveness of surgery. Uh, we, my specialty involves a lot of lumbar spine surgery and also uh, scoliosis surgery uh, on an elective basis. And over time, most of my patients have been getting these uh, surveys that seem to capture a broader outlook on how satisfied they are. And the question now is, is it a valid way 
or should I say valid proxy of actual health care outcomes. Um, and really, it all began, I have nothing to disclose right now, uh, but it all began because of an unsustainable problem, cost. Uh, this data looks more like a, uh, a pandemic surge, and it's only cut off at 2008. This is over the last, uh, beginning from 1998, when there was a surge in the cost of of, of performing uh, scoliosis surgery, uh, lumbar spine surgery. And from 2008 upwards, it skyrocketed uh, that the actual capture is over 100% uh, from the early 90s. There hasn't been any revolutionary changes in what we do in terms of spine surgery, but what's contributed to this and why has now driven people to start looking at patients really being served well. Are they being satisfied um, with the use of implants and the rising costs? So why is the cost uh, a big issue now, particularly in healthcare and also in spine surgery? The reasons are many. Implants, they're, the more technologically advanced implants, the more uh, uh, the more it, it costs to get them to development and also to sustain uh, the rigorous testing, etc. And that adds to the cost. Also marketing as this is the latest and greatest and also the aging population needing these kind of surgeries um, and also the implants, uh, the techniques leading to better surgeries have improved costs. The last thing I want to talk about is collusion, which is the uh, cost of these implants within a small restricted company could lead to a lot of price gouging. And that's one thing that I'm appreciative of UPMC in terms of uh, getting the cost down. So some of the cost reduction buzzwords that were used um, that you come across will be, is this creating value? Is this a patient-centered outcome, particularly with satisfaction? Are you seeing improved outcomes? And is this uh, the satisfaction related to payment specific and the satisfaction lead to quality? These are all cost reduction buzzwords used both on the healthcare side globally and also with uh, uh, companies and, and, and also healthcare outcomes monitoring uh, groups. Um, the really is it's become a proxy data used by the Centers for Medicare um, to gauge how well these uh, spine surgeries are being done because we don't really have a good amount of data to judge the quality. When you go into spine surgery, what are you really getting? How do you feel? This proxy data as to when this, have you fill a, date, uh, a survey of satisfaction is a cheap and common and is widely available. Um, the other proxy data that they use is how long were you in the hospital? Did you get an infection? And so they also lump in your satisfaction, assuming that if you're satisfied with what you uh, received and the healthcare that you received, it must be good. But the really, it, the real problem is, is, is the patient satisfaction a good proxy to determine how well your surgery was, how your long-term outcome is going to be? It's, the question is, is it good uh, proxy data or is it, only for short term and now it's being used for not only just payment uh, with a lot of insurance companies and also the Centers for Medi uh, Medicare um, and uh, it, it's also used for the analysis of the outcomes based on how the hospital is performing. So why is that? Really it boils down to the healthcare reform. Um, it's become less of a safety issue to be honest but more of a cost issue with medical economics. The issue now has to do with we're trying to move from a, a health uh, outcomes to more of a patient-centered care, and this is also promoted by the Institute of Medicine. So when we now have poor data to derive healthcare decisions versus economic outcomes. Um, however, patient satisfaction in care should be satisfaction with the outcomes in care um, as an important secondary outcome provided the aims of treatment have been achieved and the health of the patients have been improved by uh, James Wright as far back as 1999 and not a determinant of the satisfaction scores that patient gives should not be the determinant of whether they got really good care or not. 
So should satisfaction score, scores that are given to patients, surveys that are given to patients, re replace the efficacy and safety data that are, that are harder to achieve, and by how much? So there's, as I mentioned, there are agencies partnering with the Centers for uh, Medicare uh, to withhold hospital payments, um, HCAP scores, uh, your, there's also downstream effect on physicians and surgeons and also the hospital itself because the data to say is this a safe place to do surgery is are these procedures done with appropriate outcomes are very scant so they're relying on patient scores which as i said is affected by factors beyond even the caregivers control beyond the hospital's control if a hospital is seeing more sicker more depressed patients they get lower scores there's downstream effects on physicians being penalized, and also the recruitment of physicians um, could be affected by this if it goes on. So there's now strict patient screening by providers. Uh, some hospitals, unlike UPMC, uh, are not providing any trauma services. They are not seeing the poorly insured or patients that have severe comorbidities. So there's now a funneling of, of patients to more sicker to hospitals uh, such as UPMC uh, system that take care of them. So the real question is, does the level of satisfaction that you put on the paper about your care, does it equate to better care? The evidence for that is really scant. Um, there's perhaps a decrease in readmission rates if patients are satisfied, but that's only one small paper remotely. The factors really impacting a hospital getting lower satisfaction involves a plethora, including depression, psycho, psychological distress, and also uh, things that have been uh, hard to talk about. People who have low social support, post-operative care, low social support. Um, they have a, a low um, financial uh, uh, capacity, uh, unemployed, uh, poor insurance, and also they are facing major medical conditions and have poor health behavior such as excessive uh, alcohol use, smoking, or have poor coping skills based on their disease burden and also being very fatigued and um, having a, a poor sense of outcome. So all these things lower the satisfaction scores. It's been well studied on all these uh, multitude of papers that I state here. So the, uh, the, the other issue also has to do with if the patient is promised that they're getting a newer and exciting treatment, they tend to give a higher patient satisfaction. This is just a uh, procedure bias. Example, people who have a disc replacement um, will say, I'm much more satisfied with that, despite it being equal on the short term to uh, a cervical disc fusion. So what constitutes higher satisfaction scores? Now that we've noted that the safety and efficacy does not equal, is equal patient satisfaction. Basically, um, all the studies are showing that if there's an open access, it's easier to get to, uh, to, get to the uh, providers. Instead of in, U my, in UPMC, we have in my UPMC where you sign up, you can email your provider, uh, get a quick response from an extender or the provider themselves. Um, and also in, in the last few years, it seems that uh, places where after spine surgery, uh, scoliosis surgery, where narcotics are given, um, they tend to give a higher patient satisfaction score. Uh, this is really critically reduced at UPMC. But what we also thrive on is having a strong home support uh, visitor network. That's to help people, particularly with the, their own personal poor support, and also to help nip things in the bud as in, if they have an infection, they are not coping well, or potential other complications associated with surgery. So do we have the right tools for determining patient satisfaction, i.e., is it appropriate to bundle satisfaction with surgery, their satisfaction with their hospital stay, or their outpatient and post-op experience? This is typically how these surveys are conducted, but really it doesn't allow the patient to really get down to what what they were satisfied about versus what how their care could be improved. In a large study uh, done in Europe with over 5,100 patients, 
Um, after one year follow-up, uh, they looked at patients that were satisfied with um, a complicated lumbar surgery versus uh, undecided versus dissatisfied. They were able to um, see a difference in those who were dissatisfied in terms of their back pain, leg pain, and also improvement in their health, uh, quality of life response measures, sort of how much they're moving, how bad this disease affecting them, et cetera. There was, you know, that those who were dissatisfied were in the negatives, positives were satisfied. However, this is nice data when you look at it, but if you look at the error rate, if you look at how bad the, the how much overlap there was, you could see that there were a lot of people who were, um, there was not a clear distinction between those who were satisfied and those who were not satisfied. And if you look at the, this chart at the bottom, which says changing outcome in one year follow-up, um, you could see that there was too much uh, uh, error overlap in terms of the those who were satisfied and dissatisfied. So it's a hard thing to equate satisfaction with care and you, and also outcomes. In the in the in view of the uh, poor data that was out there, we looked at our own data uh, in the Scoliosis Research Society. Uh, they have a questionnaire that looks at also how people are satisfied with huge complex thoracic lumbar surgeries. We looked at, um, and, and this is a questionnaire that involves 22 questions, and the last 21 and 22, it asks if you're satisfied with the results of your back management, would you have the same management again if you had the same condition? And this is an example of somebody shading one to five, uh, whether they were very satisfied or very unsatisfied. So we wanted to look at the relationship between patient satisfaction and the health rela uh, related quality of life scores, um, how well you're doing, uh, how the surgery has impacted their lives uh, post-surgery complications, and also how well they are aligned. People coming with scoliosis, they are very crooked, uh, multiple curves. Um, and we wanted to see if we were able to correct that and are they satisfied with, with that? We looked at two years minimum follow-up and the questions that we asked were the same. Are you satisfied with the results of your back management? Would you have the same management if you had the same condition using the Scoliosis Research Society revised 22-point uh, questionnaire? So we had 24, uh, I beg 248 patients across 11 sites in the United States. This was a uh, uh, multi-institutional uh, database with multi multiple surgeons um, who had had multiple training uh, over several years. We looked at the preoperative, um, postoperative, and the change um, using these health-related outcome measurements. And we looked at all these radiographic measurements that lets us know that we whether we appropriately realign them and looked at complications, major and minor. And what we grouped them into, those who scored satisfied or higher or very satisfied as those we called the ones who were satisfied. Anybody who had uh, less than four, um, we consider them, you know, not satisfied, i.e. those who were neither satisfied or unsatisfied, we grouped them as the same as those who were unsatisfied or very unsatisfied. So we wanted to see if there was any correlation between those who had a good clinical outcome with satisfaction, in, in particular, those who had complications, uh, just to see if we can validate whether the patient themselves, based on how they did, could equate to a safety and efficacious outcome. And what we found uh, that uh, when compared to those who were least satisfied, the highly satisfied patients, they demonstrated a greater improvement in the final uh, patient outcomes uh, score. However, the, the uh, Th that was from the initial point, but at two years, it was hard to determine. And we were wondering whether it was because we had a long-term follow-up with these patients and they sort of had bonded with the surgeon and they seemed to be doing okay, but they still wanted to, they had a post-procedure uh, bias as in, well, it, it must be feeling good. This must have gone well. What we found was that even when they had a major or minor complication, so long as they continue to improve, it had no effect on your satisfaction. And 
the way in which they were aligned bore no um, no measure or should I say no correlation to the uh, uh, whether they were satisfied or, or uh, not satisfied. So then we begin to uh, comprehend and realize that the although efforts are made to provide value to the patient based on how satisfied they are with their health care, um, there's very little evidence even within our straight prospective database uh, to make that determination. So really it boils down that we cannot use satisfaction as a proxy data um, of, of good health care. The appropriate thing that we have to consider um, because because of uh, the uh, because of how difficult it is uh, to assess or to tie patient satisfaction with appropriate healthcare is to actually do the more expensive uh, evaluation of how safe things are, how efficacious they are, and also to uh, expand on continued and proper follow up. It seems some patients I'll get a referral for and ask them how often did they see the surgeon. Uh, with with the in up uh, with uh, complication after they said they never saw the surgeon, um, they barely saw the patient uh, physician extender, and they were left to see the uh, primary care doctor to follow up on 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 um, complications or uh, uh, outcomes that were less than satisfactory. So when I get the referral like that, I realize that a lot is built up with how long you see the patient and how often your follow up process is. And it allows you to not just be able to recognize patients that are not doing well, um, but also opportunities for a referral for a different level of care and also um, opportunities for uh, the patients who actually get efficacious care as opposed to relying on uh, outcomes related to how satisfied or unsatisfied they are. So there are really uh, relationship with surgeons matter, relation with healthcare providers matter in terms of how satisfied they are, but it should be uncoupled from whether, uh, based on the satisfaction, um, whether they provided a, a they, they obtained better care or not. And satisfaction and quality care are completely different due to the multifactorial effects that go into it. So I really believe that the current patient satisfaction scores that are used um, that are sent to practitioners and also to patients are not valid proxies in determining the quality and effectiveness of lumbar spine surgery. And from data that we have, it's also spilled into even primary care and other medical specialties. Um, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you very much uh, for, for your uh, great comments, uh, Dr. Hamilton. One of the uh, things that it's uh, it's always important uh, Dr. Ha Hamilton alluded it to is for you know patients to be properly and detailedly evaluated uh, before and after procedures to really understand the outcomes and to be able to optimize uh, how we help them and what we've done and not done and to really see what are what are, what are key features so uh, uh, Justin why don't you go ahead and, uh, and go over uh, questions Thank you, Dr. Freeler. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. We do have a number of questions, and and I'll uh, start off with the first one here um, for Dr. Hamilton. What should patients consider when looking for and consulting with a spinal surgeon? The that's a really good question, to be honest. Um, things that these days uh, people focus on is is what their online profile is about. Um, but really it has to do with the totality of the care. If some people are looking at, uh, before they even see the spine surgeon these days, they may get to have to a chat with a physician extender. And finally, uh, if they're viewed as based on their imaging and referral, if it's something that can be handled, uh, that's uh, at the expertise of the spine surgeon, I, I really, think this is a commitment for long term. If, if the spine surgeon is going to take on your case, a, a confirmation that this is going to be a long term um, solution, this is going to be a long term uh, uh, relationship is, is key. Uh, I, I think it's important that you, you know that this uh, 
uh, surgeon is is going to a um, literally not just operate on you, but literally have your back. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. How often are patients who are looking for surgical treatment actually would be better served by physical therapy or other treatments? That is now almost an automatic, and I have seen some detrimental effects from that, but most often I do believe due to the ubiquitous uh, nature of of back pain, particularly uh, in, in our current uh, environment, that at least people get initial x-rays um, to make sure that there's no instability uh, before they start physical therapy. I would, in the ideal world, I would want everybody to get a nerve imaging, at least an MRI, um, but due to how commonplace back pain is, the history is important. The, if somebody comes in and has horrific back pain with radiation following any trauma, I would want to get imaging before I start any therapy. If they, if this is related to an activity that's rather benign, um, I would also want to not just do the history, but also do an examination to say, is this ominous? Is there something um, that precludes me from uh, immediately starting physical therapy? Nevertheless, I think there's a great opportunity and also great space for physical therapy, um, but it's always important that it's not sort of routinely given without at least a consultation to make sure there's nothing ominous that physical therapy could uh, exacerbate. Okay, great. Um, what is the most important development in the treatment of neurotrauma that you have seen during your career? There has been many developments. Uh, currently, uh, the the most um, the most crucial, I think, is the involvement of multi multi disciplines uh, to this. Um, when when we we, we started, uh, sort of things uh, sort of like trauma care, ICU care, stratifying the patients into the uh, level of injury. Now, when we talk about neurotrauma. Uh, two things that come to mind include uh, either traumatic brain injury or spine uh, uh, trauma. And uh, what I find very fascinating is our understanding of the pathways of, of uh, nerve conduction, brain conduction, and our ability to, to also post-event um, to intervene. We're getting there. We're we're decades off. Things that have biomarkers have been important uh, for us to determine uh, who's going to uh, succumb or who's going to decline, and also new studies about uh, the timing of uh, traumatic intervention um, is becoming more and more uh, evident, uh, and it's helping a lot. And that's been a big change in terms of uh, patients' outcome. Now, post-surgeon intervention, uh, our intensive care management has changed leaps and bounds from when I started, and it's become a very revealing to me as to who does well now. And even after they get out of the hospital, a whole specialty of physical medicine and rehab and what they do at, at UPMC, we have at least three hospitals uh, related to post-traumatic physical medicine rehab, post-surgery, uh, two of them that I I, I uh, visit routinely to see patients, and it's quite remarkable how things have changed in terms of the intensity of of, of uh, rehab and and also how people do when I see them several weeks later. Very good, thank you. Um, is adult spine deformity more complicated than pediatric? Yes and no. Um, in the yes, because there is less flexibility in the adult spine, things are more rigid and fixed, and there ends up being more decades of nerve compression, more decades of uh, the spine having uh, having a, a deformity that's that's existed, and also now a large component of deformity includes people who've had prior surgery. Uh, with 
some instability or worsening due to their bone age and, and also collapse. So it makes it a little harder uh, because you have to take into consideration uh, how long this has been going on. And with one failed swoop, you're realigning and changing everything. You could run into a lot of problems. Also, people don't have illness in isolation. A, an adult will have uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, have had a open heart surgery um, and are undergoing major medical issues that you have to take into consideration. There's no doubt children are healthier um, and their spines are more flexible. However, the stakes are also very high um, with years and years of, of, of suffering if not done properly. Great, thank you. Um, how soon should patients receive a patient satisfaction survey after their operation or procedure? And uh, that's a really great question. I think it should be a continuum. Um, the real issue is it should be separated. And uh, unfortunately, these uh, healthcare monitoring groups sort of lump everything together, but it should be your preoperative, postoperative satisfaction, immediate postoperative satisfaction, um, midterm and long term satisfaction to see if there's any sustained um, effects based on how you're doing. And I, I think the real issue has to do with how do we gauge what the patient is saying based on what we've asked them. Immediately post-op is no way um, a good time to evaluate incompleteness your totality of spine surgery. I think, you know, more than at, at least a year of, of continued um, benefit is a good time to also get another survey to say in comparison, have you improved? Did you have a expected complication? And I say that because there are plenty of cases that you know this patient will have such crushed nerves that realigning them, they may be weaker, um, they will not be completely satisfied, but a discussion pre-op as to some expected uh, weakness, or should I say uh, expected complications, what I tell the patients, um, will improve. And that's why the totality of care and long-term uh, follow-up is important in really assessing satisfaction. Excellent, thank you. Is there any any type of preventable neurotrauma that has decreased during your career? A lot of them. Uh, a few that I can uh, mention is advocacy and education about, and also uh, support. Uh, for for example, um, in the beginning of my career, there's a procedure called a shell bag, it's spelled with a K. Um, that involves taking the front part of uh, the skull off to allow uh, the brain to expand uh, after trauma. We rarely do that. We used to do that quite often because even though um, people wore their seat belts, they still could overcome it without airbags uh, into a very rigid uh, steering column or wheel. Um, now with airbags being deployed, it's less and less. Uh, secondly, the um, we're only seeing that uh, perhaps in in uh, people that are not really responsive to intensive care management, uh, fluid diversion, and so on, um, particularly if they're an, an unrestrained uh, uh, device that has an ATV or motorcycle. So that's change that I can remember. Also with spine surgery, um, with the advent of really uh, uh, amazing implants and also technological advances, um, we've stopped uh, putting people in traction for days, leading to a lot of medical uh, comorbidities, blood clots, and also wound breakdowns, um, and potentially uh, uh, ruining the uh, uh, opportunities for recovery. So, um, you know, er early, uh, you know, within 24 hours of intervention um, has helped a lot. We have ability to stabilize the spine and decompress the spine. Uh, rather quickly, and it's been uh, rather remarkable. Very good, thank you. How do you deal with 
patient mental health issues with severe scoliosis or spine deformity? That's a great question. Scoliosis is not just a, a physical um, a problem. They almost every outcome measure, uh, or almost any group that measures scoliosis outcomes has at least three or four mental uh, questionnaires or even a direct discussion on how this has affected everything for you in terms of uh, not just appearance, but mm -hmm. also uh, relationships, ability to uh, earn a living and also to feel uh, worthy and also how it's actually exacerbated other access, mental health access uh, disorders you may have. It's becoming very clear that if people um, and patients are comfortable in sharing that, it improves their outcomes tremendously. Because one thing that then you can uh, expand on is to have them have a re initiating of their therapies uh, to quote unquote get them to an appropriate level to be able to have a good discussion of expected outcomes complications and how they're going to manage it it also gives you insight into their support structures and also how if they're doing not just therapy and counseling but if they're doing any medical management to get them to a point where they feel comfortable and secure to do the surgery. So it is a huge factor. There is the, the sad thing is there's a lot of people who have unrecognized mental component to their um, uh, scoliosis and to their deformity. And I always refer them uh, to a therapist with much to your surprise. But as of now, the, the handful of, of patients that I've recommended that I've yet to see anybody be very upset after they've had a discussion um, to that. And sometimes I do it in conjunction with getting some conservative management to get them fit for surgery. So it's a huge, huge uh, important uh, question and I'm glad that was asked. Yes, thank you. Uh, where do you see the future of spinal deformity sur surgery moving in the future? There's, there's no doubt about the fact that um, a component which includes uh, what we call not iatrogenic, but also setting people up for failure. As we get more outcomes, uh, we know what surgeries will get you to get deformity surgery, scoliosis surgery. But also we're getting to know a lot more even from the lab as to what, what kind of, um, what kind of scoliosis patient, similar curve, similar age group, what kind of activities and and potentially uh, genetic uh, makeup will end, have you end up getting surgery. One thing that I've noticed and, and I think it's going to be common is people who have known scoliosis who don't have an appearance or mental component to this, who start early uh, core strengthening and swimming in particular is uh, water exercises in particular. If you know and you don't have any symptoms, horrific back pain, leg pain, and you start a swimming core strengthening without excessive pounding activities, they tend to never even need surgery unless things sort of postmenopausal or age associated bone. Um, uh, bone disease or bone demineralization causes collapse and uh, concentrated uh, uh, compression of the nerve. So the future is in the what we call the muscle jacket. Um, it's uh, it helps preserve your cone of economy of your ability to maintain your alignment. And I think if more people as we get older in in our population, we get more sedentary or our activities involve a lot of pounding and abrupt stopping. So swimming uh, tends to be, you know, uh, very gentle and there's loss of gravity. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's important that people recognize that to say sedentary or uh, excessive um, 
activities without building up to it um, is, is a detriment. I see a lot of people um, sedentary job for years or on their feet at a factory for years. They retire, they spend three years uh, very, um, you know, not doing very much. And then they pick up a, a sport of their youth and they have issues. So getting the body ready it takes more stretches, more core strengthening, more training um, before you play your sport. I have patients that spend who haven't been operated on who spend twice the time uh, stretching pre and after activity before doing activities such as golfing or or or, um, or even uh, walking. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, what is your philosophy on patient care? The biggest thing for me is the patient first above all else and it's not just your spine it's everything else when they walk through the door um, it's easy when we're pressed for time uh, to to say well i looked at the imaging and i listened to you i don't see it to say what else is going on and really it has to do with a whole patient approach uh, to to the uh, spine and to recognize that unless they're coming in emergency room with serious issues, unless the exam, the history, the radiographic findings um, indicate something pressing that needs to be done, um, we have to try everything else before surgery. That's my philosophy. It's an excellent one. Uh, we have one more question for you, and I think it's a great one to sort of end our day on here. Uh, what is the most exciting thing about being a part of UPMC and Pitt as a neurosurgeon? I think um, that's very easy. It's really the nimbleness of a large institution and the cohesiveness of the uh, healthcare uh, providers here. I have yet, and, and I had a chance to practice in, in multiple places before coming. I have yet to hear no from another colleague, uh, medical nurse, uh, physical therapist, if I wanted them to help me with anything. So that's been really amazing for me. Um, the other issue has to, has to do with in a large institution uh, such as this, uh, they're, they're not siloed. Um, and if there's something going on in, I operate in at least uh, uh, three uh, hospitals. And if there's something going on um, in one that's not um, up to par or there's some deficiency, it's easily addressed and resources are diverted rather quickly. And I find it uh, amazing, but it just shows that it's not just the healthcare providers that completely um, uh, do everything, but it's also those who are doing the back work um, that nobody really gets to see. Um, and, and, and that sense of uh, appreciation um, I, I, that sense of uh, dedication and appreciation from those who are behind the scenes, getting it all done so it makes it easy for us to deliver healthcare. I find it uh, truly inspiring to work here. Dr. Hamilton, we do have one more question sure. um, that just popped in here. I'm a, I'm a young person of color. How do you think we can encourage more diversity in neurosurgery and medicine in general? I think at this point in time, it is essential that you should uh, you should get to the open doors. Uh, there's a lot of doors open, um, and as a person of color, uh, you have to recognize that some people hold the door open, but they don't know how to do anything else. They don't. They, they're worried about um, crossing the line or doing uh, um, or offending you. So it's really up uh, up to us to to get into the door and you ask how do i get to the door is to say well i am in this field in healthcare i would like to to do better i would say that my earlier mentors um did not have any person of color but i knew that they were there i knew that they were not in virginia but i knew that there were lots of doors open for me in virginia 
and I had to walk through it. And by being a medical student, a resident, a, a neurosurgeon, I was able to connect with them to mentor. But you have to walk through that door. You have to know that the doors are always open. We're a very connected world now. And to say, I am going to take this step and and uh, they, they will reach out and, and um, connect with me too. It was wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful advice. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Hamilton. It was really been fun and a, a pleasure to have you today. Um, Dr. Freelander, would you like to end the day for us, please? Yeah, thank you, Justin. And really, uh, Dr. Hamilton, fantastic uh, presentation and very heartfelt and genuine uh, like uh, you are. Um, one of the key aspects of the presentation is the holistic approach to uh, patient uh, management, obviously putting the patient first, with, which is what we all must do and, and always do. Uh, but really, it, it takes, uh, it's, it's on the eye of the beholder in terms of how you do it and how you take care of uh, your patients and uh, as a surgeon, just to make sure that we're we're accurate and honest about our outcome, our outcomes, and uh, nothing better than to see it obviously through the patients' opinions and all that. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamilton. Uh, next week we will uh, feature Dr. Jeffrey Balzer. Dr. Balzer is one of our neurophysiologists, and to uh, do the kind of operations that Dr. Hamilton was describing, the ones that I do and ones that uh, everybody in the faculty do are, are very, very complex uh, procedures that, uh, you know, the risk of, uh, of harm is, is always there. And one of the ways that our surgery is safer is by properly monitoring our patients. And that's uh, Dr. Bolzer is really a world leader in the intraoperative monitoring. So uh, we'll be seeing him next week. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all um, uh, next week. Have a safe and uh, great uh, weekend and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.